Hi, everybody. It's uh, Nathan Rodal here again with the Orchestra Podcast. My guest today is Monique Mead. Hi, Monique. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. So we have a, a real special treat today. Monique is going to uh, run us through some bow exercises. And uh, Monique is a fantastic violinist. We uh, here in Port Angeles had the pleasure of playing the Mendelssohn Concerto with her back in the fall. And it was just a fabulous performance. Monique, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are and what you do? Sure. So I'm a professional violinist and I travel and, and give concerts. A lot of those have to do with playing the violin and speaking to audiences, particularly young people to get them excited about classical music. So I've been doing that since I was out of college, um, mostly in Germany, actually, and uh, on the West Coast. And I live here in Pittsburgh. So here in Pittsburgh, I am the um, director of music entrepreneurship at Carnegie Mellon University. I know that's a big long word for saying this is how you make money as a musician. Uh -huh. uh, so that's what I'm teaching all the students. Um, and then in addition to that, I teach violin at the preparatory school level. So these are, you know, talented young violinists. Uh, so people just like yourselves. Great. And so my first question is, if I'm a high school student, um, how hard do I need to be working right now in high school to make the cut at a college or university? What might I need to change in my routine? Well, I don't know what you would change. All I can tell you is that when I was in high school and I happened to have two high school uh, kids right here, one's 15 and one is 16, and they are thinking very seriously about going into music. And so, you know, three hours a day um, of practicing, if you want to make it into music school, is pretty much going to be your, you know, your focus. And now, more on the weekends. Let's say I'm a good musician and I'm in the chamber orchestra at my school and maybe I participate in a youth orchestra and I take privately, but I don't know if I want to major in music. Can I still play when I get to college? Can I still take lessons? You know, I would, in fact, that's what I highly recommend, even to those who get into the music program at Carnegie Mellon, uh -huh. is, you know, people, there are a lot of jobs out there for people who are good musicians, um, but not necessarily performers. So just imagine, like, all that whole online world of, um, you know, of Bose, of Spotify, of Google, of all the video games that are being made. They need people who aren't there playing the violin necessarily, but have a very good sense of what good is and what how good sounds um, mm -hmm. to be able to make decisions about, well, how do you call a song on, you know, so that Siri can find it, for example, or how yeah. do you create a set of headphones that actually sound good on multiple instruments and things like that. So if you have skills and something else, you know, computer science, engineering, design, you know, management, business, and you're a good musician, uh, there are jobs out there for you. So absolutely. And then once you get to college, there are all sorts of, you know, clubs and, you know, things that you can conduct and, and plays and, you know, incidental music. And there, there is a huge demand for people who play music and are willing to collaborate with other people. So make good friends, too. <laughs> That's excellent. On our, our first episode, we had uh, my composition uh, professor from high school and then in college, uh, Dr. Gregory Utes, and he was talking about all of the different ways to stay engaged as a musician without an ensemble. Now, during this time, we could potentially, with all of our students at the college level or professionals or, or my high school kids, uh, come back when we eventually get out of this quarantine and maybe wow each other with how much we've improved. This is a huge opportunity for musicians all over the world to focus on technique and really minute things. But something that I've been hearing is kids saying, well, I don't know what to practice. And there's, mm -hmm. at least from my perspective, and hopefully from yours as well, there's never any shortage of, of what to do. If you locked a, a pianist or a violinist in a room, uh, they'd be practicing technique day and night, whether or not they had a, a piece of music to work on. So maybe we can talk about bow specifically today and get some things that even if we don't have a specific piece of music to work on, that we could still improve some bow technique. Well, we can. What's the great thing about improving your bow technique is that's your entire sound. You know, I can do this all day long and nobody's gonna hear it, right? <laughs> but if I, work, if I work on this and then I'm like, ooh, that's a cool piece, I wanna be able to play that, 
then you just can, and people are going to want to listen to you because you have a great sound. Um, so I'm going to give you a few exercises that are just going to develop a great sound, and these are things that I and other professionals do every day. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, let's just start with, with one basic thing, is that how do you hold your bow? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So there you go. Hey, bingo. There you go. So that's a beautiful bow hold. So remember that the center of this is your thumb being sort of against the frog here and, and that, okay. That's that, that circle. All right. And then you want to keep that. So that's your center and you got your two little bunny ears here. Make sure that that pinky is on, you know, right on top is curved. Right. And then the, the index finger, now the index finger I'm going to get, you know, usually comes down here, but if I'm at the tip, I'm going to be putting my index finger down above my knuckle because that gives me more okay. leverage to, uh, you know, keep the tip down. So my index finger is actually doing a little bit of this depending on where I am. But for now, we're just going to put it right below that, that middle knuckle. And, and there's, there's the way you want it. And round and round. So just to check that, I like to do a couple of windshield wipers. So I do like one, two, three, four, five. And then I check, is it still round? I check, mm -hmm. is it still round? And I would do not wind wipers. I would do whiplash wipers. So you want oh, really? to hear. You want to hear the wind. Okay, let's see if you can hear it. Ready? I can hear myself on my end. I don't know yeah, if it shows up on the video. So you want to do that so fast that you actually hear it, and that <laughs> really solidifies whether your pinky and your thumb are able to to hold hold it. All right. So once we got that, mm -hmm. this pinky thing. Is very important because if you take off your index and just bounce with your pinky. Pinky push-ups is what I call these. Okay. All right. Good. So we got pinky push-ups and it, you push it up and it just falls down all by itself, right? So push up and let it fall. Push up, let it fall. Now, would you it. ever, when you push up, maybe like weightlifting, try and slow the set back down because releasing a weight is always harder than picking it up. Is that something you'd focus on or is just the throwing it up? Well, for this particular exercise that I'm looking at, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I have never, uh, you know, I, I don't work on my pinky all that much, but that sounds like a really good idea. Okay. So, but, so what I'm trying to do for this particular uh -huh. one is for you to throw it up. And so I want you to remember three words. Gravity is my friend. Okay. <laughs> this is the most important mantra you can learn. When, yep. when, about your bow. Okay. Gravity is my friend. So never do more work than you have to. So if it's going up, let it fall down. Okay. You push it up and you let it fall down. Push it up, let it fall down. Okay. That's a very important part. Maybe the most important thing I can teach you. Gravity is my friend. All right. So what does that mean? So now with that same thing, we're just going to do bow taps or bow bounces. Put it in, you know, to, to, at, at the tip. Okay. And so all I'm doing, I'm not lifting my elbow at all. My elbow's in one place. And this is that windshield wiper that we were doing before. Uh -huh. But it's more that, that pinky thing. I'm pushing down on my pinky and I'm letting it fall. Okay. And this isn't uh, bouncing it off of the strings. So we're letting the pinky do the work here, correct? Right, right. So you're actually smacking it right. So you're lifting on the pinky and it's just smacking. So this is the gravity is my friend part, okay? When you smack it onto the string, we let it fall like that onto the string. Mm -hmm. It should be bouncing back up more or less by itself. Okay, so I want you to feel that. Okay. All right, so that's that thing. And do that on every, so raise your elbow and do that on every string. So G and four on the D string, four on the A, four on the E. Okay, and try to do it right near the tip. There you go. All right, so now that we have that, we're going to now move our arm like one millimeter in each direction so we can actually hear what we're doing. So we're creating a wee bit of friction. Okay, I still have my, your pinky should be a wee bit more tired right now and your <laughs> index finger is still up. So, okay, but make sure it's still going up and down like the windshield wiper is still working. Okay, and you're letting, you're smacking it down and letting gravity just let it bounce up. Okay, I'm not, yeah. Okay, so we want to make sure that, that this motion is tiny and this motion is still 
mm -hmm. alarm. All right, after you do that, then um, let's add some fingers to that. So let's just do G major and let's just do two bounces on each. So it'd be. And you can go back here. And back down, using your fourth finger when you come back down. And your fourth finger again. Fourth finger. Okay, those double taps. Okay, you should be feeling your pinky a wee bit now. So shake oh, yeah. it out. And if you want to take it, I'm going to give you, ooh, let's take it a level up from that. Okay? okay, the level up would be you just do G major with one, each one. And back down using your fourth finger. Make sure you're still getting a high bounce. Let's take it up a level. Okay, now we're going to do every time you go down, you're going to do a ricochet, which means two bounces. So gravity is my friend. It's like that basketball. When you drop the basketball, it goes boom, and then it drops again all by itself. So don't grab it. Let gravity do it. It's just a. Okay, that's all it is. And the less you do, the less you try, the better it works. Don't try to control it. Just let that basketball go, bump, bump, and then pick it up. Okay. That's a, a misconception I see all the time with, uh, especially private students when they're working on spiccato or ricochet, is that the way that a basketball bounces higher isn't by lifting it up, it's by pushing down. Exactly. Or, or letting exactly. gravity push it down for us Gravity from the right height. Friend. Gravity is my friend. Okay, and then and then you want to go past that? Sure. You do the ricochet on the up bow. Throw, throw. Okay, it's like smacking that basketball. Papa, papa. That's all you're doing. Yep. And then if you want to take it just one level up, then you're going to play twinkle, twinkle, and you're going to put random ricochets in there. So what would that mean? Like whenever you feel like it, put a double in there. So it might be. Reminds me of that story that Yo-Yo Ma tells sometimes about his, his neighbor that thought he lived next, that he had a, a small child practicing at home. And it was Yo-Yo Ma the whole time. The way that we practice doesn't always sound beautiful, but we have to do these technical things if we want to make that big, professional, beautiful sound. That, that's right. I mean, I was practicing this, and my son was on the sofa in the next room. He was like, Mom, <laughs> uh, are you playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? <laughs> I said, yes, but I'm playing it in a very special way. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to teach that to the Port Angeles kids tomorrow. So. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then you want to take it one level up from that. You smile while you're doing it. Oh, okay? really? That's the, that's the final level is actually adding that smile so people don't realize you're sweating at all. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so that's it for the bouncy boat. That's really important for so many things. For, okay. First, for just just for being loose, you know, for mm -hmm. realizing that gravity can do stuff. And then of course, later for our spiccato and for uh -huh. our ricochet and other stuff. All righty, ready for the next one? Yes, please. Okay, so this one is Martelet. Now this one is not going to be pretty. If it's pretty, you're doing it wrong, okay? So this has to be ugly. And what I mean is that this, you know, music is, great because sometimes it's pretty and sometimes it just gets you in the gut you know so this is the gut punch this is like the, <laughs> okay the grunt and uh -huh. that's what we want to feel so if you're doing for example <laughs> right that's what you want that kind of raw gutsy kind mm -hmm. of sound so how do you learn the gutsy well this is what you do what i do is um I put my metronome on, okay, to 60, 
All right, so that helps keep everything really disciplined. And then, as you're doing a gut punch, well, first what I'd like you to do is to the metronome, I just want you to say, ha. Huh. But when I say ha, huh, I mean like from your gut. So you're taking, put your hands on your tummy like this, and then go, okay? Like let all of the air out go, ha, 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 Okay, so it has to come from here. So that's the same kind of thing. So I'm going to put my bow on the string. Okay, it is not pretty. So hold on. One, two. So by grabbing the string means you have to hear a little bit of get that? kind of like the wiggle bow strategy where can you wiggle the string without playing it? Oh yeah. That amount of grip? Yeah. Okay. Right. That amount of grip, right? And then I'm pulling it, but I'm leaving. So gravity is my friend. That means all of the weight of my shoulder and my arm are in there. And they're going. <laughs> Punch to the gut. It is not one of these, if it were going to be pretty, I would release it and be like, oh, it's ringing and that's so beautiful. That's not what I'm going for. I'm going for pull and kill it. Okay, I'm just as stuck when I get there. So, and in. I am in. You cannot lift my bones. Uh -huh. That's what we're going for. It's not easy. Um, so that's why we stop and plant it. Pull, plant it, pull, plant it, pull, plant it. So yeah, I like that wiggle bow. Let's add the wiggle bows in there because that's really good. Wiggle it. Okay, not supposed to be pretty. Of course, if this is going to work, particularly if you're on the D string, you have to be like around track two on your violin. Oh yeah. You have to be really close to the bridge. And how does the weight change at the tip especially in my hand to make okay. that wiggle because it's much harder to do the wiggle bow at the at the tip than at the right. frog so what i'd like you to do is actually go, go back to your perfect bow hold like this uh -huh. okay and then lean in so remember i said we're going to put our knuckle we're going to put the bow above our second knuckle here and get rid of your pinky okay so now i am totally anchored in fact i could lift all of my other fingers right all of my other fingers like that and just like <laughs> Okay, and that's not because I'm squeezing and pressing, it's just because I am ideally set up for all of that weight that's in my arm and my shoulder to just lean in. I'm just leaning in. And I hope the students watching this see that it's not that you're you're pushing or pushing yeah. down for it's letting the, the weight of your arm transfer to the string. Right. And that's something that has to be, you know, really um, practiced because look, if I'm pushing, if I'm pushing, it's different. It'll sound scratchy. So if I'm like pushing and there's that scratch effect, but if I'm, if it's just like heavy, heavy, let it go, let it go, let it go. There's something that weight is making, not just the top of your string vibrate, it's also making the bridge and the top of the fiddle and the bottom of the fiddle vibrate. And you're going to realize that you're getting kind of a quality grunt. That's like, mm -hmm. okay, a quality grunt. Um, out of well, the and That's why we need it. And this isn't just about good sound, too. It's also about saving your shoulder. Um, how many of your, your colleagues are experiencing yes. some level of shoulder problems as they get right. later on in their years? They right. could have been prevented. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is totally about saving your body. So the second, so the step up from that is now, if you're really good with your math, then I do three against two. So this is like one, two. So it's one, two, three. And back down. And then I do four. Mm -hmm. Okay, and of course you can go 
up from there. But I would, I would do at least that. So what does that teach your arm? That teaches your arm how to relax into the string at any given point in the bow so that then when you go to play a beautiful legato, your, your arm is going sink. It's sinking all of those times, but so, so then it was like, oh, how do I make a crescendo going to the tip? That's how you do it. Because you sink, 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 sink. Right? You're sinking, sinking, sinking all the way. And building some muscle memory about how much bow you need to use, uh, exactly. depending on the length of the note and the, the volume of that note. Yeah, so what I do to, to help myself, because you go cross-eyed if you were trying to figure out how to divide your bow, uh -huh. is I just, just so nobody else sees it, just me, um, I put a little sticker right here in the middle of my bow so oh, that I know interesting. Where, where the half, halfway point is. And it's just like a little dot, you know, one of those little dot stickers, just so I can see it nobody else. Great. So that's how I do that. Um, and then what really helps there, so back, so it's for the legato, mm -hmm. and also I have one trick for you mm -hmm. um, when you're at the tip that helps a lot because a lot of times when we're like heavy here at the tip then everything kind of goes down like this and that doesn't help so <laughs> <laughs> so if you want something to be heavy you need counter pressure right it, it, so you have yes. to push it back up and then that doubles the weight on it right doubles the weight and so this is my thing whenever I go to the tip I'm always going one inch up with my scroll so it's mm -hmm. And if I do nothing, if I don't increase the weight here at all, and I just do this. And just raise my scroll. It's a magic thing. And it makes uh -huh. it matter just doing that. Well, and in lines with letting gravity be our friend, if our scroll is pointing down, the bow is going to go like, exactly. if, if it's up, we don't have to think about being in, I call it lane four or five right next to the bridge. Yeah. Some, some right. people say one or two, but. Yeah, uh, yeah, the higher the scroll is, the easier it is to keep it right next to the bridge where we get that big, loud sound. Right, so I just make that a habit when I'm <laughs> to practice that. Practice just the lifting of the scroll. And I, for me, it's like a, a little bit of a dynamic thing um, yes. in terms of, you know, you don't want it to be frozen in any given position mm -hmm. um, because that's all for all kinds of reasons. Um, so, so the last thing I want to show you was with the legato. Mm -hmm. of, so that's part of that legato stroke. So now that we've done a great martelet, mm -hmm. you'll be amazed how good your legato stroke is now, how good it sounds. So in addition to that sort of lifting it, I want to give you um, a review of everything that we've done that mm -hmm. I focus on. So, which is when I am at the frog of my legato, I'm going all the way to the frog, which means my elbow is up, right? And I have no pressure on my index finger. In fact, I, when I get to the wrap here, I slightly raise it so that all of my weight is in the pinky. That means I'm never going to crunch at the frog ever. Mm. Okay. So, and then when I get the, when I pull my bow, everything's like perfect bow hold in the middle. When I get to the tip, I'm going to do this thing like I showed you. Okay. So I'm going to slightly, I, I'm actually raising my pinky at the tip so that all of the weight, so I remember it all the way so it's a bit of a seesaw okay mm -hmm. it's like this when i'm at the tip bit, i'm lying into it when i'm in the middle it's like this and when i'm at the frog i don't want all that weight on there because it's already so i do a legato stroke that i practice just for that which is just <laughs> adjusting pinky index with counter pressure pinky index counter pressure okay and i do that and usually i put my metronome at four beats per bow so we're still on yep. 60 and i do that on four beats per bow so it's really smooth and really long um I love that one. That's like the fingers are on this imaginary seesaw. Yeah. Between seesaw. index and pinky. And that's just the just moving your weight. That's mm -hmm. all it is. It's just moving your weight. It's just like a seesaw. The weight balance just um, just changes that way. 
Okay. And one tiny last tip is like a tiny breath of magic. And it is your breath is that it's hard to get to the frog a lot of times, you know, we're like, and this is good enough. I'm good. You know, I'm gonna say, you know? So, but you know what helps if you, if you're, even if you're standing and now take a deep breath in, and we take a deep breath in, it automatically floats your arms up and oh. in, it automatically floats your arms up. So now try this. If I'm doing that four beats for bow, it's like, okay, breathe in and out and in uh -huh. and out breath in and out and in and out in out and that out automatically releases weight uh, into it and it's like oh then it just feels so good because you're breathing we so do a, they, a lot of breathing exercises in my class yeah, i take okay. a poll all the time who's forgetting to breathe who isn't yeah. breathing if they played it wrong were you breathing good and so breathing strategically you yes. know, to actually help you bow and again if you see that little dot in the middle that is your breathing dot so oh, okay do the exhale starting in the middle so mm. exhale because that's where you need the weight inhale so I'm inhaling and here I'm actually holding and exhale. Mm. Inhale to get me to the frog, hold and, and I hold because if I exhale here with a little bit more vehemence, I relax into the tip and it lets, it lets the weight uh, sink into it. So um, you can experiment with that. That's like really smart. A little I love bit of magic where, and then all of a sudden you don't feel like, I am a statue playing the violin. You feel like <laughs> the violin is just an extension of my breath. And then people who are listening to it start getting into your groove and start breathing and moving with you. Well, and an audience loves to see a violinist who looks effortless. Mm -hmm. When it really looks so easy. It's just, it's more interesting to watch and you're, you never feel anxiety for the performer. You know, when you yeah. see those people that are, you know, like, straight up like that or they look really tense you you, yeah. you sit there and worry for them <laughs> right 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 so hopefully those are those are some tips to make it more effortless Grab great our friend breathing counter pressure those little things now i've got a couple of little tiny questions before we sign off here if that's okay okay, okay. uh the, as as i got into college and was a really practicing and playing, I was already practicing pretty seriously, but really um, digging in deeper and being more intentional with my practice. The, the pinky was the finger that I was more worried about. But as I've progressed as a professional, the with all of the focus on pinky and middle fingers and thumb and different bow techniques, now I have a lot of uncertainty about what my pointer finger is supposed to do and where it sits. So we talked a little bit about the how it changes frog to tip, um, but maybe what are some kinesthetic indicators or, or what will I feel, what am I supposed to feel with my pointer finger? The pointer finger is, is, is kind of like your barometer of, of weight. That's like the weight distribution, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the one who says, oh, I need it more here, or I need it more there. So, you know, you should never feel any like any tension in that finger. Um, but I feel it just, I feel things at certain points of it. So again, if I am, for example, you know, I am, I'm definitely feeling the counter pressure of the thumb against the index finger. And I do feel it right there above the joint. Um, I think what's just as important is knowing when not to feel. So here, you know, like every time I play a chord, you know, if I'm doing something like, something like that, I am lifting my index finger. There is no pressure there whatsoever. Otherwise, it's, you know, you don't want that, that, that crunch. Yeah. And so if, if that's happening, and if you watch great violinists, like, you know, like, um, uh, David Oistrakh, for example, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean they literally lift oh, yeah. their finger the every time they come to the frog. I was just watching, my, my favorite violinist ever is Maxim Bengarov, 
and mm -hmm. he was doing a, a home concert uh, with a couple of friends and there was this kind of scrub a dubby spot and his pointer finger was just wagging the whole time. It was, you know, pointing opposite directions of the room on every 16th note. Oh yeah, yeah, he does that, yeah. Right. <laughs> so there's, um, there's just a sense of if, if you're the frog, you don't need that extra pressure, so take mm -hmm. it off. Yeah. Well, in uh, David Oistrock or Maxim Venkarov, I think people would categorize in their heads as a more aggressive sound, but, but really it's very light pressure at, at the frog, like you've said. Right. I mean, for me, Oistrakh just has like one of the most smoothest sounds. Vengarov has a lot more, you know. I mean, oh, yeah, he's got the crunch. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but again, I mean, you, you need that to be heard across the room. You yes. Know? And, so, and so you have to realize that if somebody's going to hear a beautiful legato or a staccato under my ear, it is scratch, 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 scratch. Yes. <laughs> And, and it's just like if you're speaking in a room, the articulation that you need for your consonants, mm -hmm. right? You're like, psh, psh, psh. so there's a lot of percussion in there. And the percussion that, that gives definition to our notes are those icti. You know, if, if it sounds pretty under my ear. Now, what, what is that going to sound like 20 rows back? So, so that's just kind of either disappears or it's just a blah. So that's why this martelet thing is so important. So even you know to get mm -hmm. every single one of those up ups with a little uh, which is that starting thing of the martelet, uh, that's going to sound a lot better than people. And also if you're nervous, you know, <laughs> you know people playing from the air and uh, you know like that, it's just not going to pay off for you. Uh, my next question is about etudes. Yeah. Now, I, I'm kind of an etude nerd, and I, I know all the books, and I've looked through them, and it's just really hard if you were a student to know which ones are going to work for me and which ones do I really need a teacher in the room for. So if I'm a high school kid stuck at home, and I'm a pretty good violinist, what etude book should I maybe look for if I'm trying to focus on tone? Well, you know, I mean, Kreutzer, number one, Oh yes, yeah. is really hard. He's got everything. Yeah, and to play that, so to play that exactly what we did, like the Marchelet. Mm -hmm. uh, so putting that on, you know, sixty, and make that your your you know your eighth note, and play them. You know, like all of those, you know, and holding it and figuring out how you have to divide your bow and just playing that Marchelet loud, and then afterwards doing the legato and feeling that same thing. I mean, for tone development, like that number one practiced in that way, first martelet and then legato is really, really mm -hmm. helpful. Um, and then, you know, if you want to do, uh, you know, Kreutzer number two with all kinds of different bow strokes, which yes. they give you, yeah, that's really good. And I would do those in different, you know, parts of the bow. So, mm -hmm. you know. all of those but just making sure that whatever you do I mean the, it's really not about the notes it's about how the notes sound you know so it's, no matter how far you get into the etude it matters about the quality of what you're doing yes while you're doing the etude <laughs> so I would highly recommend actually to you know record yourself and mm -hmm. then go back and listen because it's so it, it takes so much concentration to play the violin so much and you can't oh, yeah. possibly be you know listening and trying to make something new happen at the same time with equal quality so i'm a big devotee of burton kaplan's book practicing for artistic success and it's mm -hmm. all about the how to expand your limit of awareness and focus it like a pinpoint on on whatever it is that you're focusing on at that particular moment mm -hmm. I got two very tiny questions and then we could be done. Uh, first is I see we are in agreement about chin rest position, but why chin rest in the middle and what does that achieve? Well, I mean, for, for me, it, how should I say, it gives me, it, it makes me feel like the proximity to what I'm doing is more centered. Yes. Right. So if I have my chin rest here, I feel that like all of this sag and drawing down is, is, is a lot for me. Well, and, and so I feel it in my shoulder too, is that if I'm more open, 
that it's, yeah. it's putting stress on my shoulder blade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's more centered, it, it just feels more natural. Yeah. So, so for me, yeah, this whole thing just feels more centered down the center of my, you know, shoulder and, and you know, eye of vision. And then I feel that it's not so hard to hold up an entire instrument because, mm -hmm. you know, leverage is just different. And my, my very last question, would you tell us a little bit about your violin? Oh, yes. Well, this violin is a Stradivarius from 1717. Now, um, in all honesty, uh, it was built by Stradivarius in 1717 and then had some damage uh, to it, as happens. You know, there are wars and people are taken off with violins or stepping on them or they get burned in the attic or whatever. I'm not quite sure what which tragedy befell this one. Um, but then it came into the hands of um, Jean-Baptiste Villon, which is like the one of the premier oh, yeah. violin makers in France, and I actually own an instrument by Guillaume. And so um, he replaced the top of this Stradivarius. So it has a, um, a Guillaume top to it. And okay. then the rest, um, the back is the, or the original Stradivarius from 1717. Mm -hmm. um, and it is um, worth a lot of money. And so, so much that I cannot afford it. So it belongs to Carnegie Mellon University. Mm -hmm. And um, the great thing is that they have an instrument that's very expensive and that will appreciate in value. And maybe in 50 years, they'll sell it for, you know, $10 million. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, if they need me, they need somebody to play it well. <laughs> yep. And so um, that's the deal. And with most of the great instruments in this world are owned by like the Japan Foundation yep. or Deutsche Bank or and um, so it belongs to them, but they give it on loan to uh, you know, musicians who will carry their name around and also keep the instrument alive because it is a living thing. It needs to vibrate, it needs to breathe. Mm. Well, the, I, I, in a similar situation, I have a, a violin that is on loan to me. I, I'm very blessed that a, a couple of luthiers that I know will just send me a violin that's sitting around not being played. And within a week, it's a completely different instrument every time I get one that, that needs to be played. Mm, that's I, right. I don't know if that's something you've noticed with violins that have maybe sat dormant for a while. Uh, you maybe might not like it at first, especially if you're a high school student that's buying an instrument. Maybe it's a new instrument or has sat in a shop for a while. Uh, you may not appreciate the sound right away, but playing it for a while, it opens up and changes a, a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, and uh, especially thank you for telling us about your, your instrument. That's, uh, it's got to be a real treat for you. It is. It's, it's a real, real pleasure. It's like, like a painter having like every color in the rainbow that they can paint with, so. All righty. Well, uh, I've got a couple more questions off camera here, but I'm going to go ahead and hit uh, stop recording. Thank you so much. Uh, and on behalf of me and my students, we really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Practice hard.